Hello and welcome! In this video, you can join me as we head back to the 18th century. For the coming season, I thought I'd make a springtime outfit and decided on a pet en l'air. Further, I'd challenged myself to use only fabric left over from other projects and not to buy a single scrap of fabric or notion. I'm pleased to report that I succeeded. So without any further ado, let's get started. I started with the lining, laying out the pattern pieces over the fabric, which is what I'm doing here. For this project, I used my JP Ryan pattern. This is a pet en l'air pattern that comes with instructions on how to lengthen it into a full robe à la française. This pattern might look familiar to you, as I used it for my green sack in full length. And here's what that looks like. Following the pattern's guide, I cut two sleeves, two front pieces, four pieces for the understomacher and four for the facings, as well as one back piece on the fold. This is white cotton. Linen would, of course, be a more historically accurate choice for a mid-century Englishwoman, but I don't like working with linen, and this is still historically plausible, so cotton. I also had this in my stash, but not enough linen, which sort of made the choice for me. After transferring the necessary markings to the wrong sides, I could construct. I started with the front lining pieces, and there is a bit of a weird part here, so I'll explain. In order to create the understomacher and connected facing, I made a little sandwich along the center seam. The front lining piece was the middle of the sandwich. Then the layers were as follows, from bottom to top. Understomacher layer, facing, front lining, facing, understomacher layer. I sewed this along that middle seam. Then I turned the understomacher pieces toward one another, right sides together, over top of the other pieces, pinned them, and stitched along the marked line, which ended up being over an inch from the center. After this, I flipped the lining right side out. After this, I turned the outer side and the top 5 eighths of an inch inward and top stitched everything in place. The last step here was to create a boning channel and insert the quarter inch bones. Though for some reason I didn't film all these steps, here's what the top stitching looked like. Next, I could create the tied back. First, I transferred the markings for the boning channels. Rather than using tapes to create the channels, I did something not recommended specifically by the pattern but that I see on most extant garments. This was to cut the fabric a half an inch away from the marked line and fold each side inward, and again top stitching, in order to create those channels. There was no need to finish this further as this would be pressed against the wrong side of the silk. I also added a bit of binding to the top of the cut in order to stabilize it and finish this raw edge. With this done, I made ties from the same cotton and top stitched them in place before slipping in the bones. It was a simple matter then to join the back piece to the two front pieces, both at the shoulder and at the side, and clip and press the seams as necessary. Then I popped it on my dress form so I could fasten the ties to the appropriate width. Ta-da! Following this, I turned the top and bottom edges toward the inside, clipped as necessary, and top stitched all the way around. This, again, I did by machine. I could have done it by hand for a greater degree of historical accuracy, but given that I'm already using an ahistorical understomacher, and the fact that the only time this will ever be visible is if someone takes the garment off me and stares at it, I opted for the speed of my home industrial machine. Sleeve setting was the second last step for the lining. First, I had to sew up the side seams of each sleeve, clipping and pressing them open to allow for the greatest possible flexibility. With this done, I flipped my sleeves right side out and stuffed them through the arm size with the lining wrong side out. For the 18th century, sleeves are actually pleated in place. Between the two marked points across the bottom of the arm side, I pinned, then pleated up the remaining volume with four pleats across the cap. These pleats faced backward and, because of the nature of extant garments, didn't actually have to be the same size. Then I sewed up the seams and clipped them. Lastly, I angered everyone I live with by setting in grommets, which is a very noisy affair. Grommets are completely anachronistic for this period, but considering that the understomacher itself is an anachronism, I wasn't going to waste my time doing handbound eyelets. I had done handbound eyelets for my Francais, let's be honest. What you're seeing now is the process of setting a grommet with a mallet. After making a hole, I inserted the grommet and placed the washer on top, 
Then, using tool and die, I hammered each one in place. There was an anvil under there for extra strength and fun. At some point around this, I also cut the interlining for the stomacher. Please ignore the wrinkles for the sake of my dignity. The stomacher consists of four layers, with two layers of interlining between the lining and the fashion fabric. For this, I used leftover scraps of linen, top stitching the two identical pieces together along the side seam and leaving the top open. Then I marked the boning channels and simply stitched them through both layers of linen, in order to give myself three three-eighths of an inch boning channel for, correspondingly, three quarter inch bones. With this constructed, I top stitched the interlining to the lining, wrong sides together, and set it aside. With the lining done, I could move on to the fun part, silk. This is a lovely pink silk taffeta from Silk Baron, left over from my robe à l'anglaise. That's what this dress looks like. I like to buy lots of extra, and in this case, it was just enough for this project. I laid out my pattern pieces over the fabric, made the necessary markings, and cut. In addition to using myself as a giant pattern weight, I use these pudding dishes. Only the fanciest equipment for me. From the silk, I cut two back pieces to make up the huge sack back, two front pieces with included material for robings, two sleeves and the stomacher. I was quite restricted on fabric, so I didn't use the pattern sleeve ruffles. Instead, I drafted my own winged cuffs, which I've always wanted to try. But a bit more on that later. Because silk frays terribly, I stay stitched everything, and I mean everything before pressing. Let's head back to the stomacher. With the lining and interlining stitched together, I could place right sides of the lining and silk together and stitch the seam allowance around the outside, again leaving the top open. After this I trimmed the excess allowance and flipped the stomacher right way out. Following this, I folded the raw top edges inward, pinned them, and slip stitched them together. Soothing and surprisingly easy. The next spot to tackle was the sack back, which is deceptively simple and gives the garment its distinctive silhouette. I pinned and stitched the two matching back pieces together along the center back seam, right sides together. With these two pieces joined, the back is quite voluminous. As you can see, it takes up more than my whole table and it wasn't even a full length Francaise. You can imagine what my workspace looked like when I was dealing with a trained gown. The pattern gives extremely simple instructions for these pleats. So long as you measure and follow them, you'll be in for quite an easy ride. Here you're seeing me pleating the first set. And it's not a great camera angle, but I do have that limited space, so my apologies. There are actually three sets of two pleats for each side of the sack, and not just the two that are immediately visible. You might save on a bit of fabric by only doing the two most obvious sets to create the double box pleat, but a further set concealed beneath and visible only from the side actually gives the gown a distinctive fullness that is absent when these pleats are omitted. Since these pleats are hidden beneath the two further sets, after pinning I top stitched them in place by the machine. Then I moved on to the two sacked pleats on either side of the center back seam, carefully folding and pinning before running a machine top stitch across the top. Take your time here, adjust and readjust as much as you need to so you have the crispest possible pleats. Last was the final two sets of stacked pleats, which fold over the original two. With these folded and pinned, again I top stitched. After working on a flat surface, I then moved this to my dress form and smoothed everything down to make sure that it was all hanging properly. Take your time here, you're in no rush. With this done, it was time to finish the back. The first order of business here was to attach the back neck piece. First, I pressed its bottom seam allowance toward its wrong side. Then I lined up the top edge of the neck piece with the top edge of the pleats and laid the neck piece over the top of them, wrong side of the neck piece to right side of the pleats, with the edge folded over. After I'd pinned it in place, I top stitched the neck piece along that bottom folded edge. I also top stitched the pleats down the first few inches attached seam on most sack backs. I assume this is to keep the pleats neat and crisp. All of this I did by hand, and while my stitches aren't perfect, I'm happy with them. I was also pleased to do this by hand instead of by machine, as I had done with my previous sack. With this secure, I flipped open the neck piece so I could sew along the top of the pleats once more to give them some extra security. Then I trimmed off the seam allowance of the pleats so I could fold the back neck piece over, pin, and whip stitch in place. With the back completed, I moved to the front. 
The first step was to make the darts. I transferred the markings from the pattern to the wrong side of the silk, using chalk on the stitching line and a pencil on the folding line. I used chalk in this case to be extra cautious. Even though these markings would be completely hidden by the robings in the lining, I wanted to make sure that they wouldn't show through the delicate pink silk. Then I pinned the darts together and stitched with right sides together, before pressing them towards the center front, which for me is the opposite of what we might usually expect. And there you go, you have a slight curve to the bust. The next step involved this meme, because it was time for robings. Because by trial and error I figured out my own way to do it, I'm using the pattern to show you how, and not the very confusing process of filming. First, fold and press the seam allowance toward the inside. Then at marking two, fold over the right side, covering the dart. At marking three, pinch the fabric as shown, so marking three is folded under toward marking four. If you do this properly, you should have both a robing and a facing. When the robings were done, I breathed a huge sigh of relief and moved on. I joined the front and back pieces together at the shoulders first. Then I joined the side seams together, leaving open the bottom half for insertion of the side panels. The shortness of the seam is due not only to the fact that I'm quite short-waisted, but also to the beauty standards of this part of the century. While the very early 18th century idealized ever so slightly longer waists, waistlines rose throughout the century and culminated in the empire waists we see of the Regency. Cool, right? After admiring my handiwork, I plopped this massive pile of silk onto my table so I could insert the side skirt extensions. These are wedge-shaped pieces of fabric that add some extra floof. With right sides together, I attach these extensions first to the back, stitching all the way from hemline to waistline. When connecting the front, I left open the top few inches of the seam to create a pocket opening, as recommended by the pattern. After pressing open the seams as usual, I rolled the seam allowance of the open part at the top of the extension and front panel, doing a quick running stitch to secure them and allow for a fray-free opening. I also hemmed the garment in the same way. Time for sleeves. This was pretty much identical to the lining. I pinned, sewed, then clipped the side seams and turned the sleeves the right way out. Flipping the body inside out, I stuffed the sleeve through the arm side. Then I pinned the marked dots and pleated the rest in knife pleats, again facing backwards. With this done, I moved back to the skirt extensions. To create the appropriate volume, I, you guessed it, pleated. Historical sewing is mostly pleating, I think. It's difficult to explain this, so I'll show you as I do my best to put it into words. Essentially, I created a bunch of stacked knife pleats, folding the skirt extension into the back. Then, using my sewing machine, I stitched along the top of the pleats to keep them in place. Joining the lining to the fashion fabric was an ugly, but effective process. As you look at my ugly version, I'll say that there are many ways that you could make it prettier, but given that the only person who'll ever see it is me, and you, I suppose, as long as it's functional, I don't mind if it's not the most beautiful. I simply put the wrong sides together, pinned, and whipped the lining to the outside. I do wish I'd used white thread instead of pink, however. Then I pinned the skirt pleats to the bottom of the lining and used a combination of running and back stitches to attach these to the lining. This helps distribute their weight evenly and keeps them in place, with the back pleats folded away from the pocket toward the back and the front ones away from the pocket toward the front. Now, cuffs. I opted for a winged cuff. I consulted a few resources, namely Patterns of Fashion, and my absolute favourite, which is this 18th century book called Fashion in Detail to get a sense of how I might pattern the winged cuff. Though some make it a bit more complex than this, I knew that using a rectangle of about 7 inches by 20 inches pleated at the elbow would do very nicely. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough pink silk to cut each cuff from a single piece of fabric, so I did as they did in the 18th century. I pieced. You can see this sort of piecing on this lovely garment, which has an additional fabric saving touch. No pleats. So I cut identical pieces from the lining and the silk. Four in total, each one 10 inches by 7 inches. Then I joined the pair at the side seams, this time using a smaller seam allowance of 3 eighths of an inch as I was really trying to save on fabric. With the seams pressed, I put the right sides of the silk and lining together, sewed 3 inches from the edge and turned them right sides out. To finish these along the open edge, I folded the raw edges inward pinned, and used slip stitches to seal everything in. After this I did some rough pleats, eyeballing them so they were the volume I wanted. I stitched them down, hiding my running stitches in the seam. 
After clipping and folding the sleeve edges inwards, I placed the cuffs. This I did by pinning, readjusting, pinning, readjusting, and pinning some more. Once I was at last happy with their placement, I attached them with slip stitches, also joining the top free edge of each cuff to give it that really wing-like appearance. At this point, the end was in sight, and I was eager for it. Since I didn't have enough fabric to use the ruffle patterns provided by J.P. Ryan, I drafted my own using this organdy. It's from Renaissance Fabrics, by the way. It's an easy process. You just have to figure out the length you'd like at the front and the back, then connect them with a gentle slope. I also opted for two sets of ruffles, stacked to create volume. After machine stay stitching the top edges, I rolled each hem and whipped them down with little stitches. I purposefully did not clip the curves as I wanted to keep the ruffling created by using ease alone. With this finished, I could join each sleeve ruffle at its side seams, careful then to roll the seam allowances to finish them properly, something I did because organdy is translucent and raw edges would be visible and unsightly. Then it was just a matter of stuffing them inside the sleeves and backstitching them into place, which is certainly not something you need to see. Time for decoration, the best part. Here I'm showing you the pet en l'air in its final-ish form to show you that I opted to keep it reasonably untrimmed. The first reason for this is that this is an undress style, making it appropriate for day wear, but not for fancy balls or parties. As a result, we might expect it to be a little less over the top. Further, I wanted to show off the robings. I'd done this hard work on making proper robings for my Francaise, but then had covered them with ruffles. This time, I wanted them to be visible. Lastly, I was running out of pink silk and didn't have enough to make a huge number of ruffles. Since I didn't want to put any of the contrasting green fabric on the actual pet and lair, just in case I wanted to pair it with a different petticoat and stomacher, I left it untrimmed. However, I really like the look, and I'm glad it's on the simpler side. Instead, my stomacher and accessories got the trim. This is, by 18th century standards, almost ridiculously tame. I wanted the effect of garlands of spring flowers, so I made ruffles out of green silk and topped them with pink rosettes. All this is done by hand, and though time-consuming, is lots of fun. I cut out scalloped strips of green silk. Then I used a doubled up thread to run a line of gathering stitches along the middle. You could measure these exactly, but it's not necessary, especially for this period in history. This also creates more of an organic look, perfect for replicating greenery. The rosettes got a similar technique, but they had scallops only on one side, and I ran the gathering stitches along the bottom, non-scalloped side. With the stitching done, I pulled the gathering thread as tight as I could and twisted each strip of fabric into a sort of little spiral. Then I used that same thread, still connected, to stitch it in place. The result was this kind of tiny, darling little rose. I think they're adorable. Then I attached the roses to the garlands. After that, I attached them to the stomacher, sewing everything by hand. I think the effect is simple but quite evocative, and it ties in the petticoat well. I also made a choker to match, attaching a similar garland to a length of pink ribbon. Then I added a bit of frayed organdy to create a little more texture. Fraying the organdy was really, really fun, and it gives a soft and feathery effect. Here I'm showing you how I did this. After cutting a strip to size, careful to pedal along the grain, I pulled the lengthwise threads one by one like this until I had the desired amount frayed. After that, all I had to do was gather each piece into a ruffle and attach as desired. The majority of this organdy went into the little tricorn I made to go along with this costume. I didn't film the process of making the hat since I expected I'd mess up a few times, but I didn't. Talk about bad self-esteem. Topics of psychotherapy aside, here's a quick rundown. I made linen buckram out of linen scraps and xanthan gum, cut them to shape, and covered each piece in silk before sewing them together. Then I added organdy ruffles and a little silk rosette to match. Maybe in the future I'll film my millinery adventures, but not today. The hat was made exclusively by hand, and this was so fun. And believe it or not, that's all. As always, thank you for joining me. Hopefully this outfit will help usher in a much-awaited spring. Until then, you can check out my other videos. If you're so inclined, you could even like, subscribe, and follow me on socials. Everything you need to know is in the description box. Thank you, and take care.